Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 through 20 I like to tag this text the spirit filled walk the spirit filled walk Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15 through 20 one of the things that we have grown up on and have often experienced in church throughout the years and throughout the ages is the mystery of the Holy Spirit. People not really knowing who he is or what the Holy Spirit does. People have been thinking throughout their life experience that the Holy Spirit is the one that just makes us jump and shout in church. That we can always recognize him or see the evidence of the Spirit when somebody screams and shouts and jumps and runs and does their dance. We'll say, oh, that's, he caught the Holy Ghost. We've talked about it in week one. But then we began to work through the words of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in John 13 through 17 on what he said the Holy Spirit would do and who the Holy Spirit was. And we've come to the point to where we're now going to look at what does it mean to walk the Spirit-filled life out? We saw in week two that the Spirit testifies through us, that, that he fills us to testify through us, to talk about Jesus. That whenever you saw in the book of Acts that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, the next thing you would see is that they would speak about Jesus. Jesus told us that when the Spirit came, he would testify about us and we would also testify. And so there's one aspect of spirit filling that's called the spirit filled witness. We've already looked at that, how we witness for Christ and speak about the goodness of Christ and what he's done for us. That's the spirit filled witness. But today we want to talk about the spirit filled walk, how the Holy Spirit benefits you and I every single day and not just in a shouting moment in church and then that's over but how the Holy Spirit literally benefits you and I every single day that we're alive. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, be careful how you walk. Now, in Ephesians 5, verse 15, when he says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, it is the fifth time since chapter 4 that he said, Therefore, be careful how you walk. It is the very, it's the fifth time that the Apostle Paul has connected therefore in your walk. In other words, based on the fact that God saved you, you ought to walk with Jesus Christ. You ought to walk in the living power of his grace and mercy. This is the fifth time. In other words, it is important for everyone to know that God is just not uh, dealing with you shouting in church service one day. He is dealing with how you and I live every single day. Because the word walk means how you live your life. It, it literally means how you flesh out all that you know about God, all that God has done for you, and how you actually flesh it out in the way you live every single day. He says, therefore, in essence, in the Greek language, we'll be see, walk carefully. In other words, don't just walk around not paying attention. It would actually say, therefore, walk carefully. Pay very close attention to the way you're living. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And that which you do as you're living and walking out your life, there is an accountability of the Holy Spirit is right there with you experiencing everything you and I do. The way you and I live, what you're really saying is, is that you have God on the inside living inside of you. And the way we live with God on the inside, is it the same way Jesus would have lived? Is it the same way Jesus would have handled that situation? Is it the same way when Jesus was also mishandled by people, how did he handle them? So he says, therefore, be careful how you walk. He says, and, and, and here, watch these contrasting words, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Notice how he talks about from unwise to evil days. So then do not be foolish, there's that word, but understand what the will of the Lord is and do not get drunk with wine for this is dissipation or will destroy your life. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. Ephesians chapter five, verse 16. When we are full of the Holy Spirit, we don't have extended seasons of walking foolishly and wasting time. When you are full of the Holy Spirit and you have been filled by him and the word filled means to be controlled by. Notice that he says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Because when an individual is drunk with wine, the, 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 the liquor is controlling what you say and do. Now, I might not be familiar with this experience like some of you all are, but, 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 but what happens is, 
What happens is, my mom and dad are in the audience, I'm not familiar with this experience. But what happens when an individual is what we call own fool, lit or tanked up, is that all of a sudden, you didn't have any confidence to ask that lady nothing about getting on the dance floor. But now, you got something in the system, and you walk up like you all that, knowing you can't even dance, and say, will you dance with me? It begins to control you. There's something, there's a force that is controlling you. He said, but don't let wine control you. He said, let the Holy Spirit control you. And he says, and when you let the Holy Spirit control you, you do not waste your time. Watch this. He says, therefore, uh, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Notice he says, walk wisely. Walk wisely. In other words, with all that you've learned about God, what does it mean to walk wisely? Here it is. With all that you've heard about God, with all the information that you've heard through sermons and Bible studies and through your own study, what do you do with it? Is it just a message heard or is it a practice lived? Do you actually just hear the message or do you go and practice the message? When, when you're frustrated or disappointed in a relationship, do you just continue to think about it or you go and talk to the person? See, to walk wisely means I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated. I, there's something wrong in this relationship, but I don't just think about it. I go and talk to the person about it so that God could reconcile us and we can see God move in the nature of our friendship. That's, what's, that, that's wise. But what is unwise is to live like a fool. To have the information of God and do nothing with it. In other words, you have the word of the living God, God breathed word, a God breathed message. Here is the Bible. And you say, I want to know God for myself. He said, I left you 66 books. You can get to know me if you want to. And how deeply you dig into the book will be how deeply you know him. When you need to call on God in a rough situation of life for a promise of God, do you have a word that you can turn to? Recently, we've been dealing with a sister who was in the church and she's been sick. And it's been amazing to hear the doctors say two times I was in the room when I didn't really want to be in the room to hear this news. She should have been gone. The doctor came in and, and, and spoke in the room and the doctor said, watch this now. He said, uh, I'm in the room visiting with the member and seeing the mom. And the doctor says, um, things have turned for the worse. It's going south. He said, uh, take the machines off. And I'm in the room and I'm saying, Lord, why am I in the room at this hour? R -r -r really? And, and, and the daughter is listening and her facial expression never changed. Okay. And we got to praying right there in the room and realize why we were actually in the room to call on the name of God. But here's the interesting thing. Before the surgery went down, she said, Pastor Blake, Royce Robinson, I got me a verse. She said, in this verse, she said, I'm going to tell you, Pastor Blake, it's in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 17. I've been quoting this verse for 37 years. I quote it every single day. It says, the Lord will heal your body. The Lord will restore your strength. The, and she said, I've been quoting this verse for, for seven, 37 years. She said, so Pastor Blake, I ain't worried about it. She went into the surgery and everything turned south. But she believed something before she went into the surgery. After the doctor said that the surgery went south, and then two doctors said, no, she's supposed to be gone. We've come back to hear two people in two different places say, the hand of the Lord must be on her. Why? Because she's supposed to be gone. He said, when we looked at the medical report, she's supposed to have been dead. And on this Mother's Day, she's still alive. Why? Because she's walking as a wise woman. Why? How do you know she's walking wise, Pastor Blake? I'm glad you asked. Because Jesus said this right here. He said that if you have the word of God and you act upon the word of God and you build your house on the rock, when the storms and the winds come and beat up against that house, it will not fall down. Why? Because that house has a solid foundation. That's the wise man who's built it on the word. But the exact same person could have been in the hospital and have heard the word and read the word and not believed it at the moment that it was needed and be gone. 
Are you following what I'm saying? See, you got to have something. To, the word of God, you have access. I don't care how bad your situation is, but you have access to the living word of God in whatever situation and or circumstance you find yourself in. You better go get you a word to stand on. He said a wise man acts on the word, but the fool is the same man who heard the word and yet he didn't act on the word. And then when the storms and the winds and the rains beat on his house, he fell because his house was built on sand. How many of us have seen seasons of failure in our life because we were literally living like practical fools? And when I make that comment, I mean, you had access to the word of God, but didn't live based on it. And that way your situation got worse versus getting better. Notice this in Ephesians chapter five. He says, therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time for the days are evil. Now, notice this. He says you ought to make the most of your time. It literally means to redeem the time. It means look at everything that's already happened in your life before Jesus came in and entered in. And look at how much time was wasted away on foolish living because you had no access to the wisdom or the promises of God in the word of God. But now you have access to everything you need. Make the most of your time. Why? Because the days are evil. He says there are evil influences out there that would love to take you away and control your life. But he says, if you'll believe this word of God, he says, you can make the most of your time. You can redeem every moment, every hour, every second with all that you've gone through. You can believe God and watch God come through. See, some of us are wasting time right now thinking about how much time we've already wasted. Let me rewind, press play. So many of us right now are wasting time doing nothing, paralyzed in nothingness because we're thinking about all the time that we wasted. Don't think about that no more. Think about all the time that God has in store and ahead of you and how God wants you to redeem the time. He wants you and I to make the most of our time. Most of your time. Notice this. He says, here it is. If you're full of the Holy Spirit, we don't have extended seasons of walking foolishly or wasting time. Are you living a wise life? Are you producing things that God has placed in you? This is an individual encounter between you and I and God to where God will say, Blake, what did you do with your time? That there were seasons and or moments of time that I put in your life for you to maximize the time. Can I, can, can I give you one? Back in the day, I began to write as a youth pastor a lot of curriculum. I began to write my own stuff. And, 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 it, and it did a lot of life-changing things. And some people came to me and said, man, you ought to publish this material. You ought to get this published. And I said, ah, yeah, whatever. And so Eric Mason, my friend, said, Blake, he said, look here. There is a window open for you in this season of life with all the thousands of kids you've taught across the country for you to publish this material. He said for people to realize that you were a voice and could leave a legacy in the urban church for what happened in African-American and minority people's kids lives. He said, but Blake, the window will close too. The window will close. He said, Blake, You'll be irrelevant in this area with all you've done if you don't make the most of your time. While these people are saying produce, he said, get something out. See, in other words, God gives you and I seasons with a window open. And then all of a sudden, the window can close. Make the most of your time. Because God will watch how you're using time, either with wisdom or with a lack of wisdom. And God will say, the window's closed. You don't want assignments that God has for your life to pass by and God close the window. All the influence and all the impact you were designed to have in the life of others for the glory of God, God closes the window. And see, here's the deal. A lot of people have been mistaken in church and they're mistaken because they believe that church is about the pastor and not about the people. According to the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpieces, his workmanship 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God has prepared for all of us that we might walk in them. In other words, God has something designed exactly for your life and it might not be your job. He might use your job, but God literally has assignments for everybody in the pew and far be it from the pastor, the preacher, not to let you know you got an assignment. And don't let the window close. Make the most of your time. Notice this in Ephesians 5 verse 17. Apostle Paul writes and he says, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. When we are full of the Holy Spirit, we maximize the seasons of life knowing and in doing exactly what God desires. He says, don't be foolish. Don't act like God is not trying to use you. Don't act like you don't know that God wants to do something through you. He said, don't, don't, don't be foolish. Now, notice he went from unwise to foolish. He went from unwise to foolish. See, a person that's unwise lacks information in the first place. Therefore, they don't know exactly what to do because they don't have the time with all the information that they need to have worked it out. But the foolish person is the person who knows all the information and rejects the information having known what Jesus said, the fool. See, unwise, you just lack information. You don't have enough experience yet. But the fool is the one who has all the information that Jesus has laid out and yet still builds his house on sand, does not act on the word. And therefore, because you don't act on the word, your life crumbles away when it didn't have to. The amazing thing about write this down, write this down, Matthew 7, 24 through 27. When Jesus talks about that in Matthew 7, 24 through 27, you need to write that down for real. When Jesus talks about it, here's the thing that blows you away. The two people heard the same sermon. The two people, heard, Jesus had just preached the Sermon on the Mount. They heard the same sermon. They had the same information. One person acted on it. And when, the rough, when, when life got rough and tough, that person made it. When the other person who didn't act on it, when life got rough and tough, they didn't make it. Same sermon, same information. Watch this. Both built. Both put in the energy to go build something. But one was built on nothing and one was built on the solid rock. The foolish person is the one who has all the information in the world and yet rejects applying the word of God to their life and their situation. And here he says in verse 17, you got to see verse 17. He says in verse 17, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You need to know exactly what God wants you to do. Your purpose today on this Mother's Day should be get down on your hands and your knees before a living God and say, God, if I do not know what I'm supposed to be doing, show me. Show me. Young lady from our youth ministry called me. She said, Pastor Blake, do you have a word for me? I said, what do you mean? She said, uh, Pastor Blake, I was a youth pastor back in high school. She called me Friday. She said, Pastor, do you have a word for me? I said, what, what do you mean I have a word for you? She, she said, I've been sensing that God has a word for you to give to me. I said, oh, okay, all right, well, I got a word for you. I said, sis, get in your Bible and read because you will not live a life on purpose without knowledge of your spiritual gifts. Because a lot of people are waiting for this mysterious word. And there is a word, it's a word from the Lord, and it's right there in that book. And you will not live a purpose-filled life absent from your spiritual gift. You have to know who God is making you and why God has designed you to benefit the lives of other people. And if you don't exercise the use of your spiritual gift, you will live a purposeless life. She said, Pastor, that's enough. I said, amen, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> now, let's look back at the text, Ephesians 5, verse 17. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Right down next to that, 1 Peter 4, verse 1 through 6, just for your own notes to go read. And then he comes down to this, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for this is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And he says, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord and always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another. Now, here's this next part. When we are full of the Holy Spirit, we are singing and thanking God and submitting to our fellow man. When we are full of the Holy Spirit, he said, be full 
of the Holy Spirit. And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, notice what he says. When you're filled, he goes to verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, one of the things that you do is you have a vertical relationship with God. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have a vertical singing and praising and thanking God for all that God has done for you. Let me make it plain. In other words, when you are full with the Holy Spirit, and sometimes some of y'all find yourself in the kitchen out of nowhere saying, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found blind, but now I see. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. See, 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 every now and then you ought to just be there and sing yourself a song. Every now and then you ought to have a song to sing amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Somebody ought to have a song in your mouth. He said, you ought to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to one another and make melody in your heart to God. You ought to think through all that God has done and let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You ought to say, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make a boast in the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You ought to say, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. You ought to every now and then have a song that you look back over your life and say, only God, he's a good, good father. I didn't have one, but he's a good, good father. You ought to have a song to sing and go vertical with God. I bless the Lord at all times. You ought to have something to say to God. He says, you ought to have a song. If you don't ever have a song, He said, you ain't spirit filled. He said, when you begin to think about God's goodness, a song ought to just come up out of you and you ought to get to singing one. See, some of y'all haven't really thought through life. See, can can I give you a song? You, You think about this one. I should have been dead and gone. Sleeping in my grave. Some of y'all ought to have been dead and gone. You you should have been in your grave. But it was the mercy and grace of God in some life situations to where you were headed the wrong way and God just turned it like that. Then he says you ought to always give thanks in all things. Notice what he said. You ought to always give thanks in all things. In other words, with all that I've been through, I want to see how I can continually give God thanks. Why? Because it didn't get as bad as it could have gotten. I should have lost my mind, but I'm still in here. I should have committed suicide, but I'm still in here. I, 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 I should have, but, but, but I'm still. You ought to give thanks to God. When you look back over your life, can you really not give thanks to God for what he's done? He said, when you're spirit filled, you ought to be singing some songs and you ought to be giving thanks to God for all things. I can look back over my life and I thought there were some bad things that happened and God used some bad things to make some better things. Are there, are there one or two of y'all in the building today? Let me go on and testify for Joe Bolden since Joe don't got the microphone. Joe got let go from a job. Joe, we got to let you go. Only get another job and they got him way, way, way up high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joe had to get let go and not have a job to get this new job that he didn't have no qualifications for, but to get way, way up here and they, they got something in store. When you look back over it, it ain't something you can give thanks for. The spirit filled life has some singing, it has some praising, it has some thanking. But then watch this after you go vertical, get horizontal. He said, watch this, and you submit to one another. You know how to treat each other. You know how to have deference for each other. You you know how to look at your brother as more important than yourself. He says that when you really, really, really are spirit-filled, and after you've gone vertical, and after you quit singing, after you quit thinking, he said, submit to one another. The way you handle people will always be in the challenge of how whether or not you're spirit-filled or not. See, you can come in church all day, weep, cry, flip, do the black flip. Do, you can do all that. But when you come down to how you treat people, how you have relationships with folk, and God will challenge you, watch this, over and over and over until you pass the test of people. 
You got to pass the test of people. And you know what the first person we have to get over is? Ourselves. The first person you got to get over is yourself. And once you can get over yourself and live your life for other folk, considering others and submitting to them, he says, oh, you got it. Oh, you got it right, right, right there. You got it. But watch this. He's going to move. Watch this on this being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because y'all, y- 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 some of y'all know those churches that we grew up in to where the only feeling we saw was, yeah, and that's the only one we saw. I tell y'all all the time, the only spirit filled that I knew growing up was Uncle Willie. My dad and mom are in here, great man's on Baptist church, about 35 minutes in the past the bacon sermon. I don't know if he was trying to get the sermon over, you know, or what, but he was like, and then all of a sudden he was going to jump up and scream. Eight men were going to pack him out. I'd be watching mom. What he got? He got, he got called to Holy Ghost. I said, oh, I don't want that. That's all I knew about it. She, he called the Holy Ghost. I was like, oh, no, no, no. Uncle Willie would come over to the house. I'd be going to another room like that. <laughs> but he moves from this whole thing about being spirit-filled to these practical evidences of the spirit is in your life. The spirit is in your life when you have a praise life, when you have a thanking life. With all that you have gone through, he said, you can thank God still. But then you got to treat your brother right, and he's going to start working out how you do it. Watch watch this. Here, here it goes. He says to the wives, he says, when wives are full of the Holy Spirit, they're submitting to their husbands and honoring God. Amen. Can I get an amen, sisters? When wives are full of the Holy Spirit, they are submitting to their husbands and honoring God. Check out Ephesians 5. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He himself being savior of the body, but as the, as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. I'm going to teach this to my mom right here. Mom, you need to be uh, full of the Holy Spirit, submitting to dad and honoring God. Amen. God bless you. Dad. I'm going to try to help you, dad, today. Watch this. In other words, what happens is this word subject, I've taught you in Bible study. I've taught you in Bible study. The word subject or submission, it means to, it's a military term, submarine yourself under. Submarine yourself under. Submerge yourself. In other words, a submarine was designed to be submerged under the authority of the water. And when the submarine, which was designed to go under the water, submerged in the water, it will go far, it will go fast, it will go deep, it will go all over doing things. Why? Because it is in the proper position. But you take that exact same submarine and put it on land, it goes absolutely nowhere. And perhaps some of the wives need to know today that if you would submarine yourself under the authority of your husband, God would take you places you never thought before. He says, now, when you do this, you don't do it because of him. You do it because of the Lord. You don't do it because of him. You do it because of the Lord. In other words, wives, be subject to your husband as unto the Lord. Now, watch this. In other words, wives, you can't be spirit filled. (laughs) That ain't it. That ain't it. How you know, Pastor? Well, I read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 6. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. You can't be spirit-filled always giving some lip. You can't be spirit-filled always going off on. You got to submit yourself as until... Hey, look, is this Mother's Day message? Yes, yeah, Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Look here, women, women... Child, please. He says that when you are spirit filled, you submit to your husband and you honor God. But then he comes back right after that and he says, husbands, here's what you need to do. He says, when husbands are full of the Holy Spirit, watch this. We are sacrificing, washing, presenting and loving our wives while mirroring Jesus. Y'all, when you read Ephesians 5, 22 through 24, ladies, y'all got off good. 
All he asked y'all to do was submit. But what he asked us to do is, I want you to uh, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, washing her and sanctifying her in the water of the word and, and, and presenting her faultless and blameless and, and watch this and, and loving her. Watch. In other words, God put massive responsibility on the husband. Why? Because he compared the husband to Jesus. There is no greater honor in your life being born a biological male to be compared directly to Jesus. You, you, let me rewind, press play. I ain't talking about whether or not you like the pastor or not. I'm talking about to be compared to Jesus. That when your wife looks at you, she needs to see a living Christ. Do you hear? Brothers, God so loved you. By making you male, he would compare you to his son. Y'all, y'all, it don't get higher than that. Right now, ESPN had these little arguments about Jordan and LeBron and all that. Forget that. You've been compared to Jesus. You've been so far upgraded over that argument right there, brothers. Man, you, you need to know God when he looks at you and made you male. When God knew you before the foundation of the world and chose to make you male, he said, I'm putting a little Jesus lookalike on the face of the earth. So when a man is spirit filled, he sacrifices for his wife. He washes his wife in the water of the word, areas where she's broken, area where she needs to be built up. He comes in and puts the ointment of the word of God in her life where she needs it. He wants to present her faultless and blameless before God. And then he wants to love her like he loves himself, cherishing her and nourishing her. Now watch this. Listen, husbands, very carefully. When you're spirit filled and you don't pour the word of God into your life, uh, into your wife's life. If you don't pour the word of God into your wife's life, you've got a malnourished wife. He says in Ephesians 5 to cherish your wife and nourish your wife. Cherish her and nourish her. He said no man neglected his own body. When you're hungry, you go to the refrigerator. You go get something to take care of your body. He said, I need you to nurture your wife the same way a mama would nurture a baby. Feeding her the word of God and growing her and maturing her and washing her and making her cleansed by the word of God. He said, that's when the husband's spirit feel. When husband's spirit feel, watch this. He moves all that foolishness out the way to say, baby, you are my top priority. I got to make sure you're not malnourished. Y'all, my wife and I owned a dog and, and when we had this dog, uh, we first got her, Nestle, I wanted to make sure that she had all the right kind of food. So, so y'all, we wasn't on that Alpo and all that kind of jazz, man. We was like science, diet, neutral, and all. I mean, you know, you know, like, 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 I like Nestle food costs more than ours. So, if I can give good quality food to a dog to make sure that my dog was as fit as can be, and God gives you the word of God. To make sure that your wife can be as fit as she can be. And once I became a dog owner, I used to look around at other folks' dogs. And I said, that dog is overweight. Look at that dog right there. This dog, his ribs all showing that he ain't nourished. How does your wife look? Is she properly healthy based on the word of God? Now he's saying, hey, you want to be spirit filled? That's it right there. Make sure that you're feeding her properly. Now, he moves on and says, because that's your wife, y'all got lucky. Ephesians chapter 6, y'all had a kid. Check out chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, he says, watch this. Our kids can be full of the Spirit. And how are our children full of the Spirit? Obeying and honoring their parents. Children, I don't care what age you are, obeying and honoring your parents shows that you're filled with the Spirit. He said, obey your parents in the Lord. Why? Because with that word obedience always comes a blessing. He says, notice the promise to obedience. Long life. Long life. Yo, I don't want to stay here long, 
but I want you to understand the implications of long life. That when children obey and honor their parents, that God will generally grant them long life. The opposite of long life is what? Short life. Obey your parents. One of the little practical things that we have at our house with our children is first time obedience. Simple word in our house, Reagan, Robert Chance, first time obedience. We're not going to be saying it 17 times. First time obedience. Obey. Why? Because connected to obedience is a blessing for you, a promise, long life. Nobody's trying to raise their hand. So I'd like to check out here real early. Why? Because people want to live a long, full, healthy life. He said, children, here's how you live it. Obey your parents in the Lord. Now, I'm so glad for mercy and grace. Y'all, see, see, because... I might be the pastor now, a little older, but a long time ago, Blake be home at 12, 245 roll up. Mom, they, we was out, I mean, we don't know what happened, mom, the car broke down. Blake, come home, I spend the night, come, be, be back the next day. See, but God, in all of my foolishness, was saying, I got to get a fool like you saved. And here it is, is that God looks over our time of ignorance by mercy and grace. And that says, obey your parents and honor the Lord. So our children can obey and be spirit spirit filled. But then I, let me close with this because I know everybody's excited about it. He says, uh, fathers, here's your deal. When you're full of the spirit, you're leading and teaching their, your kids the word of God and the ways of God. Now, notice in verse four, he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but raise them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Do you notice what was left out? Do you know what was left out, out, out in the verse? Mothers. Mothers were left out. Children, obey your parents. Honor them. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, raise your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Don't provoke them to anger. In other words, the primary responsibility for child raising is not on mom. In God's economy, the primary responsibility of raising God lookalikes on the face of the earth is the little Jesus lookalike who got married. See, the Jesus lookalike who married this lady now has reproduced through his wife a little child. He said, you are responsible for raising your children up to be God lookalikes. The primary responsibility of raising children to the glory of God is on dad, not the mom. See, when you deal with God's economy, brothers and fathers, he says the primary responsibility of how your children turn out is going to be based on the work you put in. How did you lead and teach your children? That's spirit filled. So when a father is sitting down with his child and, and, train, and exchanging with them and talking with them and, and sharing something with them and correcting them, that's spirit filled. That spirit field. No need to try to be your kid's friend when you've been called to be their father. No need to try to be the nice guy and let mom do all the discipline when you've been called to be the father. And then we'll leave you with this. When workers are full of the Holy Spirit, they are obeying and serving the Lord, not looking for the approval from man. Now watch this. He goes from being spirit filled to worshiping God to having a good relationship with your fellow man, to now more intimately you're involved in a marriage. And now from that marriage, he moves into you parenting and raising children. And now he moves to being spirit-filled into the way you work on your job. Y'all, we've been going through Bible study the last two weeks on it's vocational, dealing with working for God. And it's been amazing how God has moved in that Bible study. Because here's what God is showing you, is that the Holy Spirit is not just good in church for you to shout. The Holy Spirit is good enough for you to go out and work and let somebody see Jesus through you. That when you go to the workplace, somebody ought to see Jesus through you, and you're not working to please your boss, you're working to please God. Now, when it comes down to walking out the Spirit-filled life, he said, that's it, plain and simple. He said, when it really comes down to the way you live your life, now you, you just ready for somebody to shout. See, most folk are waiting for that service. Uh, 
I, I sense in the room right now that there are three people that God is moving on right now. He's got a special thing for you. If you'll come down right now, uh, there, there are three of you in the audience right now. I sensed it right now. And you come down. I lay my hands on you. You pass out. And y'all say the spirit was high. You know when the spirit is high? The spirit is high when you said I do. The spirit is high when you said I do. The spirit is high when you say I do every single day in your marriage. The spirit is high when you go to your job on time. And you work on your job. The spirit is high when you treat your brother right. When you solve problems with your brother. The spirit is high when you're praising God. The spirit is not just high when you... And y'all know that we ain't got no good church because ain't nobody come put the thing over me, all right? So here's the deal. We ain't expecting the spirit to be high in here. We ain't, we ain't got no, somebody should have ran up and covered me up. See, the spirit's not just high then. The spirit is high when we leave this place and God is working in all of your everyday life and it's evident that the spirit is in you in the way you keep on loving your husband in the way you keep on loving your wife, in the way you keep on raising those children, in the way you keep on working on that job that you're frustrated with, in the way you keep on praising God and giving God thanks for all that he's ever done. And then the way you treat your brother, the spirit is high. When it comes down to the real spirit-filled walk, Paul lays it out in those areas. Your worship life with God, your worship life with your fellow man, your worship life in your marriage, your worship life in your raising children, and your worship life in your workplace. He said, those are the places where I want to see the Spirit show up. Let's pray.